chapter 14, medical overview. I hope you can hear me with my mask on. Uh, maybe you see people dress like this out and about when you're practicing our social distancing or they're wearing gloves uh, or they're wearing a mask like this as they're going. But uh, it is going to be something that we're talking about here. And it seems very appropriate because this is the hot topic. Everybody has a mask and you guys being new to EMS probably aren't too sure how to use it. You may have noticed that I had to shave so that I can wear one of these masks regularly. Um, we're gonna talk about this in just a minute, but I'm gonna take it off because I've been wearing them a lot lately. So chapter 14, this is medical overview. And really this is just kind of a broad idea of medical emergencies. Um, this is really short. This is probably gonna be a 10 minute video at the most. Uh, we're going to talk about people who are calling EMS and they need our assistance because they've had a medical or tra uh, traumatic emergency, or sometimes they've had both. So traumatic emergencies involve injuries resulting from physical forces that are applied to the body. Medical emergencies involve illnesses or conditions that are caused by disease. So some of the types of medical emergencies that we're going to see, respiratory emergencies, very prevalent right now. Patients have trouble breathing where the amount of oxygen that's being supplied to the tissues becomes inadequate. Cardiovascular emergencies, those are caused by conditions affecting the circulatory system. Neurologic emergencies are things that are involving the brain, strokes, aneurysms. Gastrointestinal conditions like appendicitis, diverticulitis, pancreatitis, and uh, many others. We're gonna talk about those, as well as urologic emergencies, kidney stones, problems with uh, urinating. Endocrine emergencies, most commonly caused by conditions like diabetes. And hematologic emergencies are the result of sickle cell disease or blood clotting disorders. Immunologic dis uh, emergencies involve the body's response to foreign substances and toxicologic emergencies, poisoning, and substance abuse. GYN emergencies involve the female reproductive organs. Some of the lectures coming up are going to get more specifically into all of these, but this is just an overview of what we're going to be uh, learning in the medical unit here. Some of these emergencies are caused by physiological or behavior problems. They may be especially difficult to deal with because the patient does not present with typical signs and symptoms. So in our general assessment principles, uh, we're going to approach these patients like any other medical patient. We're going to perform our scene size up. We're going to take our standard precautions to complete primary assessment. We're going to gather the patient history using our OPQRST mnemonic. Remember, onset, provocation, quality, radiation, severity or strength, and time. And we're gonna use that to determine the patient's chief complaint. So we're also going to use sample history, sign symptoms, allergies, meds, past medical history, last oral intake, or the events leading up to, and get a set of baseline vital signs. It's gonna give us a place to start. We're also gonna ask the patient whether they have recently traveled or they've come in contact with someone who has traveled, why? That's very, uh, very important now in our infectious disease because uh, of spreading of viruses. This chapter will focus mostly on uh, influenza. I believe this is circa 2017. And it's going to be important because right now we're dealing with the coronavirus. So general management principles we're gonna focus on any life-threatening emergency, right? If they're having trouble breathing, we're gonna focus on that. If they're having chest pain or some other cardiovascular issue, we're gonna focus on that. We're always gonna be empathetic. We're gonna place the patient in a position of comfort. Um, on the stretcher, we're gonna to try to keep them warm. And we're gonna use our standard precautions. Sometimes in an epidemic, right? So an epidemic is new cases of a disease that the human population substantially exceeds what's expected. Pandemic is a disease outbreak that occurs on a global scale. So we started off with an epidemic and now we've hit a pandemic where the COVID-19 is spreading, <coughs> excuse me, around the globe. Um, so 
our standard precautions may increase to something like gloves, eye pro, and a mask. So this is something that we're wearing routinely on most calls because we're not sure what we're dealing with um, or who's infected. So influenza, right? That's the flu that's coming from an animal respiratory disease and it's mutated to affect humans. Same thing with the COVID-19. Uh, that started off in an animal and it's mutated and it's now impacting humans. So people with chronic medical conditions, compromised immune systems, the old and the very young are most susceptible to influenza. Um, and this is transmitted by direct contact with nasal secretions, aerosolized droplets from coughing and sneezing by effective, uh, affected people. So that's why we're doing a mask. So a properly fitted mask like this is going to protect us from the aerosolized droplets. Uh, this is an N95. You may have heard that one out in the news or uh, you may just be familiar with it from your, your jobs. Uh, this is going to filter 95% of the particulates, um, and it's a good first line of defense for protecting us from these droplets. Same thing with eye protection. It's going to keep droplets out of the eyes, uh, so it may look something like this. Honestly, these are the eye protection that I use with my uh, mask, as well as gloves, gown, maybe even a face shield on top of it to prevent all of that contaminant from getting into my body. So diseases that can be passed by the respiratory route, we're always going to wear our PPE, gloves, eye protection, and a respirator. Uh, put a surgical mask on the patient, so you see people walking around with a surgical mask on, and that's good for keeping the germs from entering the atmosphere. So when we put it on the patient, really what we're trying to do is prevent the patient from spreading it to us. So they have a mask and it's preventing the germs from coming out. We have a mask, it's preventing their germs from coming in. And hopefully by doing that, we're able to limit our exposure. Again, gloves, eye protection, a gown, very important. The annual influenza immunization is important for EMS personnel. It's usually required um, that we get the flu shot. So moving on to herpes. Herpes simplex, a common virus strain carried by humans. Of individuals carrying the virus, 80% are asymptomatic. So you might have it you know, and probably not know it. Symptomatic infections causes uh, vesicles that appear on the lips or on the genitals. So cold sore is basically what that is. Uh, can cause more serious illness in more susceptible immune compromised patients. Primary mode of infection is through close personal contact. So HIV. EMTs face a risk of exposure, right? Because we're dealing with blood. There's no vaccine yet, but there is good treatment for HIV. It is one of those diseases that is, um, with time and science and research, becoming easier to manage. Um, AIDS can still be fatal. However, with treatment, patients expect a nor near normal lifespan. And every year that goes by, the, um, the mortality rate for HIV and AIDS decreases drastically. So it's not easily transmitted in the work setting. Our risk of infection is limited to exposure to an infected patient's blood or body fluid. So if we're using appropriate PPE, safety gear, um, we shouldn't have much to worry about. Many patients with HIV show no signs or symptoms. Uh, so just wear the proper gloves, handle uh, needles appropriately. Uh, EMTs, we're not gonna be handling needles. Um, so just take good care in covering any open wounds, decreasing the amount of fluids that are coming off of our patient, and we should be good. If you think that the patient's blood or secretions may have somehow entered our system, seek medical advice. So we're talking about their blood is directly into our body. So our mouth is open, their blood sprays into our mouth, that would be something to be concerned about. We've got a massive open wound, and they've got a massive open wound, and they've somehow mixed together, um, contact your agency's infectious disease officer and 
get that sorted out. Hepatitis, so that's inflammation and often infection of the liver. So loss of appetite, vomiting, fever, fatigue, sore throat, cough, muscle and joint pain. Later on, we'll see things like jaundice, upper right quadrant, abdominal pain, that's where the liver is. Um, Toxin-induced hepatitis isn't contagious, but there's no way to tell what type of hepatitis a patient has or which patients are contagious. Vaccination with hepatitis B is highly recommended for EMS. Meningitis, the inflammation of the meningeal coverings of the brain and spinal cord. So some things that we'll see, fever, headache, stiff neck, altered mental status. Most forms of meningitis are not contagious. Um, Meningococcal, meningitis is highly contagious. So we take standard precautions. It can be treated at the ED with antibiotics. And then after we treat a known meningitis patient, just contact your employer's health representative, which could be your infectious control officer, and let them know you had a meningitis patient. And they could follow up with the hospital and give you an idea of what's going on. TB, tuberculosis, many infected patients are well most of the time. So chronic microbacterial disease that usually strikes the lungs is what is TB. Patients who pose the highest risk almost always have a cough. So consider respiratory tuberculosis to be the only contagious form, and then just wear your N95 or HEPA mask to stop the droplets, the spread of the droplets. Infectious agents can take hold in some patients much more easily because of the reduced defenses. So older people, they have a lower threshold for fighting off these illnesses. People who are immunosuppressed from chronic illness or cancer treatment or organ transplants um, are at a higher risk. Absolute protection from TB does not exist. One third of the world's population is infected with tuberculosis. The vaccine is rarely used in the United States. Um, and the mechanism of transmission is not very efficient. So if you work in healthcare, you have TB tests regularly. Uh, preventative therapy is almost 100% effective. So it's not a big deal here in the United States. Whooping cough, also known as pertussis, oh, mostly affects children younger than six years old. Their symptoms include fever and a whooping sound when they cough, um, inhaling after a coughing attack. The best way to prevent exposure is to be vaccinated. Uh, place a mask on your patient as well as yourself. MRSA, uh, this is another common thing that we see, is a bacteria that causes infections and it's usually res uh, resistant to many antibiotics. So in a healthcare system, MRSA is transmitted from patient to patient by healthcare's pr healthcare providers' unwashed hands. So we are transmitting the disease to other patients. So good hand hygiene is important and all those things have really just come to light in the last few weeks and we're not good at washing our hands or keeping ourselves sanitized. Um, and by doing that, we're going to decrease these transmissions in all diseases. Uh, factors that increase the risk of MRSA, antibiotic therapy, so prolonged antibiotic therapy, decreases our body's tolerance to antibiotics. Uh, prolonged hospital stays, a stay in the ICU or the burn unit, and any exposure to an infected patient will increase the risk of MRSA transmission. MRSA results in soft tissue, excuse me, soft tissue infection. So localized skin abscesses, abscesses, and sepsis in older patients. Ebola. There was a 2014 outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. Uh, the incubation period somewhere between 6 to 12 days after exposure. Symptoms may not appear for as long as 21 days after the infection. So just we need to know Ebola exists. These are global health issues. Travel medicine. So be aware of travel acquired infections. So how did we get COVID-19 here in the United States? People brought it here from China. Um, so we need to be aware, where did somebody travel? If we ask the screening questions for COVID-19, which is the hot topic at the moment, where did you travel? Were you on a cruise ship? Have you been out of the country? Have you been around people who've been out of the country? Currently now, to decrease transmission in the United States, we're asking, have you been to these hot spots? Have you been to New York City? Have you been to northeastern New Jersey, so near New York City? 
Uh, and I'm ex expecting that as we see more here in Lancaster County, we're going to start asking about travel within Pennsylvania um, to try to get an idea if people are in these hotspots. So we need to be aware. Uh, when you encounter an ill patient with a recent travel history, put a mask on them. Um, and get as much information as possible. Following these standard precautions is important. Mask up ourselves, mask up our patients. And we're not going to be doing that right now because you guys have put, we've put a hold on all clinical time. So um, how does that look for the class? Right now, our goal is to finish as much of the book work as possible. Um, and I do think that puts us on an early timeline to finish the class. If we can do that and focus on the, the hands-on clinical stuff at a later date when we're all able to get back together, um, we're not sure even if we start to meet again as a class as in, in as soon as a month, um, we're not sure how long it's going to be until you are able as students to go back out on the ambulance and get your practical ride time. The possibility exists that it doesn't happen uh, for this class. And that's okay, we can make up for it in the classroom. There are other ways that we're able to do that. So um, if you're looking at your schedule and you're wondering why are we not doing EVOC, because we can't. Um, so we're moving forward as fast as we can. I'm hoping to do uh, a couple of a week and a half or so, about three class periods of time for each unit, and then get that done, and then we can focus on the didactic stuff. So that's where we're at now, and I hope that that answers some of your questions going forward. And that is the end of the video here for chapter number 14. I